Disney Plus, BBC, Netflix, Amazon. Everyone's got dreams when they're young, right? The general public probably don't realise that these yeah, industries exist. The equipment and the scarcity of it. One day we did a very large um, sort of music gig and I think it was 14 cameras in total in one area. And you have to call Paris and France and like we yeah. source certain lenses just to come over and you'd be used on one shoot and then go back. In the nature of the industry stuff goes wrong all the time. Catastrophically wrong. You get a phone call, can you turn your drive around because we've just had to cancel the shoot. Getting fishing boats out with cameras and then hoping that they all stay functional <laughs> for the next 10 months. Car caught fire with all the equipment in it. The production value of a lot of social media stuff mm. and stuff that is put onto those sorts of platforms has just like, it's kind the of budget, it has a budget for it, it's just gone massive. The roster seems to be getting smaller and smaller, but the work seems to be getting larger and larger. If you want to be behind a camera, working on shoots and whatnot, I think kit room is just, definite solid way to go. As long as you've got good passion and good work ethic, I think anyone could get into the industry. Let's go ahead and just kick it off with a quick introduction from the two of you. Mm -hmm. um, we'll go ahead and just uh, start with Jack. Yeah, I'm Jack, um, obviously from Film Store. Um, happy to be here and chat away. <laughs> Perfect. Corey? Uh, yeah, Corey Webb, um, Operations Director at Film Store Rental. Um, yeah, happy to be here. Thanks for having us. Yeah, no problem. It's uh, yeah, the first episode of the season, so happy to have you guys on. Um, yeah, we've wanted kind of someone like you guys on for a while. Um, so on our list of guests for last year, we kind of never really got around to it. Um, so yeah, good to see you guys at the Christmas party. Yeah, that, uh, <laughs> that connection and get it rolling this year. So, um, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and just jump in right away with, uh, you know, how did you guys get to where you guys are today? Um, tell our listeners a little bit about your journey and the why behind uh, the career path that you guys are both on. Yeah, sure. Do you want to go first? Or... Yeah, I can go first. So, uh, yeah, I'm fairly fresh into the industry, about four or five years now, um, before I sort of did a lot of logistics and IT and whatnot, um, and sort of fed up where I was, wanted to, always wanted to work in TV, so I just moved to London um, and got to it really, just started applying around to a lot of facilities houses. Uh, my sort of background in logistics and stuff, I thought was a really good sort of starting foot onto sort of the media trail, um, sort of shifting cameras around and whatnot, that's sort of what we do. So yes, it was a, it was a tough few six months first in London, sort of trying to get attention of someone without any prior experience. Um, so I did a course at Metfilm, uh, which was awesome, really opened my eyes to sort of what was out there, what people do, and yeah, sort of where to go and look for jobs, so. Okay, where did that, uh, where did that early passion for TV and film come from? You said you like always wanted to be in it. Yeah, so that, I think just started as a kid, like everyone's got dreams when they're young, right? So. Um, always wanted to be sort of a director or sort of in front of the camera, sort of like that. And then uh, studied at a college, um, was a classic 17, 18 year old and bummed around and didn't really do much with it afterwards. Um, just started work straight away. So I never went to university. I don't have that sort of like academic background of media. So it took me a while then to realize actually you got to, you got to go for it. <laughs> yeah yeah just exactly bite the bullet and get it done if you want to do it so yeah and then you're not from london then <laughs> so i'm from wiltshire uh yeah. sort of west west england yeah okay and obviously it's moved to london because the film industry is so yeah heavily prevalent here yeah yeah so based. swindon uh is not very <laughs> yeah, media-esque it's all right. pretty much manufacturing industry there so there was not really a prospect there. So it was, yeah, get to London or get to Bristol. That's pretty much your only options in my eyes, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't actually know much about Bristol <laughs> area, but I've heard it come up quite a bit, so it must be a budding filming area, I guess. But Yeah, it's big for natural history over there. Okay. That's usually the reason we, we've actually got a Bristol office as well. Okay. Um, specifically for that reason, um, to get into BBC natural history and other areas. Um, out of that. That's really cool. 
Nice. Well, how about you, Corey? Uh, not too dissimilar. Um, at college, I studied um, film and media studies. Did lots of home videos and projects around that. Um, I actually wanted to be a cameraman um, and go down that sort of avenue. Um, from speaking to my lecturers at college and university and things, they're always advising to speak to cameramen, like maybe become an apprentice as a camera, a camera assistant under a cameraman and go and work with them independently. Um, so I started doing that and then I did some camera assistant work for Natural, um, National Film and Television School um, in Beaconsfield and did some work with them and they suggested that getting into a hire company, a camera hire company would be a good way to get hands on with the equipment and to expand your network. Um, so I applied for a few in London, um, moved to London and ended up starting working at a West London hire company. I um, was there for a while and then I saw the older generation, the people who had gone freelance and I decided that that wasn't the lifestyle for me. Um, it's quite, it can be quite sporadic. Um, I think when you're young, it's very exciting, very good to be out there. Personally, I'm not that kind of person. I, I like a nine to five. I like, I like the structure of it. Um, to be freelance, you have to be very committed to the work and know that you could be working solidly for six months and then have six months off. I mean, you can earn so much during that time that it's obviously very worthwhile, like salary to live on. Um, but yeah, for me, I wanted something more bread and butter. Um, so I sort of stuck in camera hire, um, which was amazing. So I managed to progress my career to warehouse manager and then to the office. And then going from there, I worked similar to Jack, um, facilities coordinator, and then just build my way up really from there. Okay. Yeah. Let's, let's expand on that, that route a little bit. Cause I hear it, I mean, not like a lot, a lot, but it's come up quite a few times before that people are suggested to go to a yeah, like a warehouse and start there and then build their way up, get your hands on with the kit and then kind of go out and decide what you want to do from there. Mm. Um, so yeah, like what, I guess, why did you choose a rental house? And within that, like what kind of role does a rental house play within the creative industry? I think, um, a lot of people, a lot, the general public probably don't realize that these industries exist. Um, to a general viewer on Netflix or something like that, you probably assume that Netflix or BBC own their equipment, but they actually rent it or lease it short term um, from companies like ourselves. Um, and why is that? Because of investment and generally the technology moves on so quickly. It's not very economically viable for big companies to purchase one camera and then six months later a new one comes out that they have to sell and re repurchase. So by renting it short term, they're they don't have those overheads um, and they can manage the spend on that kind of thing. Um, so that's where we come in and um, we, we can hire out our equipment to different gen different levels of client. So the newest equipment will go to like Netflix, BBC, that kind of thing. And then we get all the way down to like student films who are happy to use other equipment that, yeah, on our catalog. Gotcha. Well, that makes makes a lot of sense. Um, I guess on why, I mean, to even expand further on why is a rental house such an essential part of the creative process? I think it's more of an essential part for even the bigger companies, like you said, but all the way down to student films, like we've used you guys um, quite a few times for projects. Hmm. Um, it just, yeah, you can expand. I mean, for us, it's basically it's getting our hands on equipment that we wouldn't normally be able to afford to pay for some cameras cost you know 60 to 100 thousand pounds mm. to buy outright which would never be cost effective for a small production company like us to just outright buy we wouldn't get enough use out of it exactly um so you have to want to expand on that at all yeah um to play on. yeah um i think that's a benefit of obviously having us around for a lot of people is getting hands-on with stuff they wouldn't normally get to use and then obviously as well having the ability to come and test and see the different kit we have and how that affects your creative process as to whether this is what the client wants normally we do it like this but now we have all these other options in front of us I think that's a a big thing why people then turn to rental houses rather than sort of just sitting with their own kit and thinking how how can we do it with this actually it's expanding that and saying 
sky's the limit if we if we can get the kit. So I think yeah, it's, we can play a hands on part in that as well when we do sort of test days for people and sort of show them what's there and what's around. Sort of you spoke about you want to do this sort of thing. Well, here's different kit to be able to do that, different lenses and things like that. Right, right, that's really cool. Um, and I guess at what what production level do you start to see creatives utilizing a rental house? Um, or yeah, like I mentioned, like every level really. Um, it depends on the content that they're creating. Um, yeah, we have uh, like big TV production companies all the way down to like student film. Um, a lot of people were getting in touch. Um, recently we did a, um, a commercial for a sports brand and the um, director wanted to shoot it all on iPhones. So we had to provide iPhone Pro 14s um, for this shoot with loads of lighting and the like all the cabling and stuff to be able to monitor it in a gallery. So although it was quite relatively low budget, but it was going for social media content that's going to be seen everywhere. So it, it may seem small scale, but it's always to a bigger audience. Um, right. So yeah, it's all, it's all very interesting. So I guess when... Uh for anyone thinking of the question, when would it make sense to like take a budget, go to somewhere like you guys and kind of like kick yourselves out and when would it not? When would it not? I don't think it wouldn't. I think uh, I think there's always the conversations to be had. I think by reaching out to rental companies, you're able to have discussions with people who know what they're talking about and even come in and have a look at the equipment. Like, we don't turn anyone away if they want to come in and have a look and start playing with equipment because we want we want more people out there to be able to get hands on with it and learn because the more people that can learn and use the equipment the more freelancers that there will be in the world um we've yeah the roster seems to be getting smaller and smaller but the work seems to be getting larger and larger so the more people in the industry the better nice no that's, that's a great answer <laughs> um yeah, so at Film Store, I know you guys aren't just a rental house. You guys also provide loads of other services, um, crewing, consultation, engineering, training, logistics. That's all from your website. Mm-hmm. Um, how does that play into the opportunities for individuals who are either just starting their careers or are looking to further their careers in the film industry? I think, yeah, starting your career in the film industry, obviously, like I have... I've, I went sort of straight into an office, but I think the benefit of working with a rental house is that just the scope of all the stuff, as we say, we work on TV production companies, we work on commercials, we work on student films, stuff in theatres, I think. And as a camera assistant, if we can send you out on those jobs, you sort of like, you get to know your niche, you can, you can see what's out there, There's so many different parts of the industry. And as a rental house, you sort of get to see them all, which is the fun of my job as well as you sort of shuffling TV shows and a commercial and stuff. It's all, everything's different. Every job's bespoke. And I think it gives you a really good insight as to what you want to do moving forward then into the media industry. Okay. Yeah, definitely. I think by going on to these sort of shoots, even if you go on as a camera assistant, you may find that maybe the grip sort of section is more, more, you're more you or maybe you prefer sound or maybe you realize that you prefer working as a production coordinator or through production at, at the production company. Um, if you're not exposed to all these different areas, you're never going to know. So I think it's worth it's worth going for it, trying it for maybe a year or so. If you don't like it or find something that you do want to follow, I think that's that's always good. I, I wouldn't have found my career if I hadn't have tried it, tried to do something. Right. So it's quite hands-on. Yeah. So what kind of like, if you start from like the beginning and work your way through it, what kind of like career progression can... Like, what kind of career progression, like, options are there if you, like, start from the very beginning at uh, a rental house like you guys? What would be, like, the first role that you get? And uh-huh. then and then where could you go from there? Yeah, so traditionally we sort of hired runner drivers, um, sort of come in, deliver equipment and meet the clients face-to-face. Um, and then the next level, sort of um, a kit room technician, which is someone who... Uh, checks in and prepares equipment for the clients i think that's the point where you really learn the kit inside out it's like yeah. there's i know a lot of people that have been on shoots and done camera assisting and whatnot I, the guys in the kit room know stuff just because because you have to do it day in day out is mm. 
you're learning problem solving um, yeah, the... by, by building the equipment for when it goes out on shoots. You, you have to problem solve any issues that may occur on the day. Um, and the more you do that, the more you learn. Um, then sort of after two or three years, um, those guys sort of go out on set as camera assistants, um, either through us or independently. And then eventually they decide to go freelance normally as um, sort of camera assistants. So every every year we sort of have a generation that sort of graduate from our warehouse and go out into the world. Um, we've had two, uh, three people who have left in the last six, eight months. And they're all being very successful camera assistants at the moment, progressing to operators. They want to be DOPs or camera operators going forward. Um, and yeah, their careers are all doing really well because of the foundation they had through, through, through working in the kit room and the people they've met there. Cool. Sounds like a pretty uh, good place to start if you're looking to get behind the camera. Yeah. Um, to follow on with that, what kind of like education do you need or do you need an ed- specific type of education to get started in a rental house? Um, I, I think I have an odd sort of start into it where I didn't really have any qualifications um i think that is the the joy of a kit house that if you can show that you're willing and at the end of the day it's hard work it's it's a lot of graft comes in with kit room and if you're if you can show you can do it and you're interested in doing it i think some somebody at some point is going to take a chance and i think the kit room is most likely the place to take a chance on someone and sort of put them in down on the kit room and say look this is what we do. This is how much you can learn in this space of time. And uh, yeah, I wouldn't say there's a necessity for a qualification, but obviously qualifications are a benefit. Um, but yeah, obviously I don't do the hiring, so I don't know what these guys look for. Um, no, I agree. I think um, yeah. as long as you've got good passion and good work ethic, I think anyone could get into the industry. Um, I think like going to film school or anything like that is a benefit and it gives you a better um, idea of the theory behind the creative process but I think unless you're using the kit day to day you may not know it back to front um, as well as you could Um, I think yeah it is just a hands-on approach because it is a a trade job um, being a cameraman I think there's a creative element if you go to the DOP level but I think to work to that stage i think there can be a lot of hard work and long hours before that um in, in our experience anyway gotcha um yeah so like kind of a reoccurring uh question theme of a lot of our episodes like i know a lot of listeners um especially at the younger stage um i guess are always faced with the question of like do i go get specific film school education do i just jump into the career field and try and slog my way from the bottom all the way up um, do you guys have an opinion on, or any, uh, I don't know, advice about which, uh, direction you would go? Um, if, if it were me, I, I would go back to the kit room again and start, prop start from there. Um, in my experience, I've seen people who go through film school and then apply for a kit room job. So that may, I mean, they, they've obviously learned a lot over the time that they've been at film school, but at the end of the day, they're starting the same level as someone who may have been 16 coming out of school um so there's 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 benefits there's yeah pros and cons to either situation but i think yeah working in the kit room getting hands-on with the kit and building your network of uh, peers through in a safe environment like a kit room i think that's a good good way of doing it cool <laughs> anything else yeah no i think I, yeah it's as I say, it's kind of hard for me to say, well, I didn't go to university. I'd never really didn't get much of that higher education level. So it, I think it's about that, yeah, sort of just putting yourself out there. Get, obviously, you need to be given a chance, but I think it's a great place to learn. I've learned over the last four years so much that, well, I yeah, learned how to do my job, learned how the whole industry works. Um, and that's just from doing it rather than paying to be right. told how to do that and about those things. Um, so to me, I think don't go to university, but obviously, <laughs> I like to stress that like both options are very biased, <laughs> and are very unique to every situation. But 
I just know for a long time, the narrative has always been like, oh, you go to school, get your degree, and then like, then you could get the job. But like equally in a very hands-on career, like the creative industry and all sorts of different jobs, not even just film. Um, sometimes if you know exactly what you want to do, going to school isn't the best option and you could get that experience three, four years earlier and have that much more experience than someone coming out of school. And when it comes down to it, your experience is what matters and can you do the job? Mm. Um, so yeah, you have to weigh up both options and kind of decide which one's the best route for you. Um, but I know people like to hear how everyone else did it and what their kind of stories were. So cool. yeah, thanks for sharing that. Um, yeah, so you get mentioned um, learning on the job in the industry, how essential is in-house training at film store um, and learning on the job within the industry as a whole. For, for our business, it's essential. Um, the guys that we do hire in are often quite uh, green um, and a lot of it is in-house training. Um, we have an in-house technician um, and engineer um, and we sort of do tutorials every, every month or so to sort of keep the guys up to speed with new equipment and how, how best to do things most efficiently. Um, that's just part of our training process in-house. Um, but obviously they then get uh, to a level where they start going out on jobs and they are working with DOPs and camera people um, on, on the shoots. And that's where they seem to pick up most of most of the knowledge that they get. How to light a situation, how to rig certain things, what situations need what sort of technologies. Um, these are all things that we can't teach them in the kit room. It has to be taught in the field. Um, because it's very situational and obviously it depends on everything that's going on there. I think that helps uh, sort of broaden their horizons and, and it's different when you do stuff in theory and then when they get set they see why, why they're doing it like that. I think that really helps um, with their, their progression going forward. Cool. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Mm. Um, I think as a whole too as well, just the entire film industry, most creative industries just on the job training is so essential there's only so much a lot of what we learn is theory right mm. so you go to school you're learning the theory you're not learning a lot of the practical application you can't get that until you're physically on the job because there's just so many moving pieces you can never replicate it in a like a classroom environment exactly um there's obviously like youtube is great all these online courses are great again if you're not out like shooting the content or like manipulating the content um, handling the equipment, doing any of that kind of thing, mm. you won't physically learn how to do it. It's just in your brain, maybe you kind of think you know how to do it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think on the job training is super essential. And especially in like our careers move so fast, technology moves so fast and never not learning something new. Exactly. So it's pretty essential to stay on top of all the new technology or, um, and all of that. So. Yeah. Yeah, that's really important. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, so let's uh, switch gears to more of just your guys' careers, what you guys have done at Film Store. Um, what comes to mind if I ask you about your favorite project you've ever worked on? It could be Film Store related. It could be anything from the past. Oh, my God. <laughs> I don't know about favorite. <laughs> we did done a lot last year. We did the uh, David Beckham one, the SSA yeah. last scores that you mentioned. Okay. Um, so definitely say that was something I'm pr proud of working on. Yeah. Um, it was a lot of hard work. Yeah, it was, it was the entire football season, um, every week sort of filming the kids play football. So that was something that's like a long, a long slog, but rewarding at the same time. Yeah, definitely. To see, see the team develop over the year is really impressive. Um, the equipment, there was also quite, well, it was very high-end equipment, so that was quite demanding. Um and yeah, to, to have that sort of long form, to be shooting over a year for a final project, it's quite, that's probably the longest project we've had to do. Yeah, that's quite long. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and yeah. That, yeah, as you said, w watching our, our guys and our camera assistants go out on that and sort of take it under their wing as well. And it almost got to the point where my job was, became super easy by the end of it because it was kind of like, there's another match day going, guys. And then that was, they just knew what they were doing. I think they became a really integral part of the crew because they were there every week, day in, day out. We had our crew there and it's, yeah, it was, it was good fun. Yeah. They were juggling it around. And so are you guys on set frequently? Do you like physically go on a managed project or are you kind of from London paced? 
Yeah. Just put no, the teams I, together and send them out, that kind of thing. I do most of my coordinating, yeah, from the desk. Okay. Um, and it's our guys that sort of take the kit there and get their hands dirty on set. So. I like to visit set every now and then. Um, I like to see how the equipment's being used and how the guys getting on. Um, but yeah, it's something I really want to do more. Biggest project you've worked on? Is that the same? Biggest project. That was one of the biggest, but I think uh, one, one day we did a very large um, sort of music gig and I think it was 14 cameras in total in one area. Um, the prep for that was quite intense just because everything had to be matching. So a lot of hire companies own a lot of stock, but they don't necessarily own 15 of the same things. So we often have to ask each other to hire, to sub hire from each other. So we get everything in the building at the same time. Um, so in order to do that, it takes a lot of, a lot of, a lot of gears going on to make everything work, to make everything work on the same day. Um, so that's often, so our largest products are often our shortest. Um, so that was only a one day job, I think, but it, the wheels were turning for that for weeks to try and get everything lined up. Um, and yeah, just get everything in the warehouse. It's quite impressive. It sounds like a logistical nightmare, to be honest. It can be. <laughs> well, that's, that's one thing I think a lot of people don't realize about the industry as well is the equipment and the scarcity of it where you can have someone say i want 15 of these want it match you want these lenses and you can ring every other facility house in the uk and they're like we don't either have it or it's on another job or you've already got it and you have to call paris and france and like we yeah. source certain lenses just to come over and you'd be used on one shoot and then go back like there's certain lenses there's only three sets in the com country or whatnot and you have to sort of have to move people's expectations on what dates they can shoot on if they really really want to use those lenses and things like that i think a lot of people don't know that they just think oh make the call and get the kit but yeah a lot of relationships and like going to trade shows and making deals and meeting other people is a whole industry in itself um and we all try and help each other out where we can yeah, let's let's talk about that actually. How important is just like networking and like creating those relationships? Um, just without them, yeah, you can't get what you want and you can't get it done. So, yeah, very important. Um, we've had contacts with suppliers for over ten years now. Um, sort of always building on that. Um, I mean, I've worked at a few other facilities, houses, as is Jack. Um, we've still got friends who work in other companies as well. Um, we often pull favors with each other. Um try and make it work because at the end of the day we all work for the same industry so we want them to, we want our clients to be happy and it's all in our best interest to make that still work um so yeah so we we have contacts in paris we've got contacts in america um other manufacturers as well um a lot of manufacturers are able to send us demo equipment so we get to try it out first as well um so yeah it's, it's all its own ecosystem um, before it even gets to the client, which is uh, always really good, really interesting. Yeah, I think just to stress, I don't think people realize just how important pre-production is in, yeah. on a project because people only ever see one, the finished product, and then maybe they get a little bit of like the behind the scenes look into like what a set looks like. I like, wow, that's a lot of equipment. Yeah. But equally like, okay, it could take months to coordinate getting all that stuff put together to even have that single day on set so yeah i think that part of the industry is pretty fascinating mm -hmm. and it, it's a part of it unless you're in it what he really knows about so yeah I'm trying to open up a few of those doors there um yeah how about uh can you tell me anything about anything that's gone terribly wrong for you guys it's just, uh, and how do you nature, fix it in the nature of the industry stuff goes wrong all the time um something breaks on set or something happens i think one of the major ones that caused me a massive headache was um we were doing a uh international current affairs documentary um they were taking kits every other week to go abroad um it's a carne so uh that's when you have to submit the serial numbers to customs um so that they can't be sold within the country um there's a lot of documentation to do with all that but anyway um the client was using the kit for about a week everything was fine and then they rang me on one saturday morning just said the camera won't turn on it became a massive thing i was going through my head speaking to other technicians i couldn't figure out what it could be either way i need the camera there same day so i rang around 
other people in the area, ran around other suppliers, and they happened to know someone who was up the road who had a similar camera, and I managed to work out a deal for them to get the camera to our client on the same day, and that was in Baghdad. <laughs> so it was very difficult to work around translation and try and get a deal done for that to happen. I think the, cam the cameraman received a replacement camera within about four hours, um, and a lot of phone calls uh, later. Um, so it was probably the hardest situation I've been in and probably one of my most proud that I managed to get it all done um, for the client to continue their, their shoot because it's not like they could be replicated because it was a current affairs show. Right. Wow. Managing logistics in Baghdad for yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> something. Yeah. Uh, how about you, Jack? Um, I think the only thing really is this got things going catastrophically wrong, especially in the last year or so is covid um a lot big one yeah <laughs> it's one of those things as well where people are sort of testing it so they get on set and we sort of deliver a huge kit and then you get a phone call can you turn your drive around so we've just had to cancel the shoot um i think they're the more catastrophic things that sometimes happens we, we've delivered kit um to up north somewhere and suddenly a contributor pulls out last minute i think it's normally human based <laughs> the catastrophes weather gets in the way all the time um kit in the desert gets full of sand but yeah i think there is normally always fixable uh, apart from obviously covid and stuff you just it's got to be rebooked um but yeah i i touch wood i've never <laughs> But it's hugely wrong. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> to preface, I think anything technically challenging can be fixed. Yeah. Or, yeah. In some way or another. Mm. Um, that's just the nature of the work, I think. Yeah. Um well, as you were saying about how important pre production is, there's so many moving parts that you you'd be working on a bespoke kit for weeks and weeks with the DOP, you get it nailed down and then one person gets one figure wrong in a postcode for the delivery or something like that it's, you know all these tiny details can can make a big effect further down the line but yeah. just this yeah as you said it's the nature of the industry that there's so many moving parts and so many different people involved that yeah something's bound to not match up at some point <laughs> <laughs> there's always a bump in the road somewhere yeah but i guess that's just the job to smooth it out yeah um yeah on the COVID note i guess um Statistically, there's way more money in the industry now than there was pre-COVID. Have you guys seen that affect your business at all? Does it seem more busy or that there's like bigger projects? Uh, historically, there's always sort of been a seasonality to the industry. Um, before COVID and before all, all of that, um, yeah, most shoots seem to occur between like February and May. Then it sort of goes down during school holidays potentially. And then it sort of comes back up again, like, from September to before Christmas. And then it sort of slows down again over Christmas. Um, then obviously we had COVID lockdown. And then after that, a lot of production seemed to just go into high gear very soon after. And I think for 2021 until middle of last year, it was incredibly busy all the time. It was just nonstop. It was nonstop. Um, so business for us has been great. And I think it's been a big boost to the industry. Um but it does seem to be going back to the original sort of gotcha. seasonal waves. Um, so, yeah, Christmas was quiet as we expected. And then this coming month's going to be picking up again soon. So, sure. so yeah, there, there was a big bulk of work. But I think it was just people trying to catch up over COVID. So we may see it going back. That makes sense. Yeah, I, I read somewhere. Don't quote me on it. But as compared to 2019, the pre-COVID year, and then... I would say we had COVID 2020. Mm. And then in 2021, said there was over four times as much money mm. pumped into the film industry as there was in 2019. And like some of that obviously had to be making up for 2020. Yeah. But equally, like four times as much is a huge jump. Yeah. But I think we'll realize that people were just consuming that much more content. Yeah. And like the COVID lockdowns really propelled that forward. Um, but yes, what great for us. One thing I've noticed over the last few years is the the production value of a lot of social media stuff mm. and stuff that is put onto those sorts of platforms has just like Sky the, budget, the budget for it has just gone massive um, whereas yeah four years ago they they were all the real low budget stuff and sometimes they're 
stuff being used on TikTok is some of our sort of high highest production value kit being sent out and whatnot. So it's, mm. it's definitely changed over the last year since mm. COVID. Yeah, I see. There's also there's so many um, YouTube TV shows these days too. Yeah, like there's so much like kids content being made on like a high production level, um, animators filming all of that stuff. I don't think any of that stuff really existed, you know, four or five years ago. Yeah. And it's, yeah, it's just taken off like crazy in the last couple of years. Your website says you'll go to the ends of the earth to make sure that film store shoots go as smoothly as possible. How far have you had to go? Take it literally or <laughs> figuratively. <laughs> uh, the furthest from film store. The moon. <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. I'm trying to think the furthest place we've sent Kit. This year is California count. Yeah, I guess so. Well, uh, yeah, I think that's pretty far. It's what, about a 10 hour flight. Yeah. I think, I'm trying to think. Okay. It's quite far to get with colonies I've done. I think actually, probably the ends of the earth ones would probably be more like trawlers and stuff. What we've done is that's a good shout. Kitting, kitting boats, fishing boats out with cameras. And then hoping that they all stay functional <laughs> for the next 10 months. Like that's, that's a tough one. Um, and that's something that our Bristol office sort of really good at. That sort of, we're sending kit into the middle of nowhere. There's no, char there's nowhere to charge it sort of stuff. All of that sort of natural history. I think that's really, sometimes that can be hard to mitigate issues on. Um, yeah, no, I, I definitely read that you guys, I don't know if you specialize in it specifically, but you do a lot of work in like, harsh extreme environments um remote stuff like that uh can you elaborate on that a little bit yeah so historically we've done a lot of bear grills work um a lot of action sort of adventure um filming um the one jack was talking about then was bbc trawlerman um so that was a really good production um but yeah that was a boatload of kit literally um going out to various locations in britain and then going out to sea for a week at a time um that was, I mean, it was a really fun product to work on, but obviously seawater is bad for equipment. Um, so the turnaround of having all that technology coming back and cleaning it all and making sure it's all perfect again was quite, quite hard. How much does it differ from a big set? I think people think of a big production, they're like, oh, you're like a giant studio, you can just plug everything into the outlets, you've got these big flights. Um, obviously you can't do that on a remote set, so you're filming in like Antarctica or out in the sea, like, you don't have outlets, you yeah. don't have giant lights that you can just plug in. Everything's got to be battery powered. Everything's got to be wireless and equally, everything's got to be weatherproof. Yep. Um, so yeah, what kind of challenges do you face there? Um, we've had a shoot grout this week actually that uh, required polar jackets. So these are insulated like rain jackets um, for the cameras. Um, yeah, we've outsourced those, buy them in, we get whatever we need to make sure the equipment's protected. Um, yeah, um, yeah, wet weather stuff, all that sort of stuff. We, these are all third party accessories that you have to have in order to, to get the job done sort of thing, to protect the technology and make sure the shoot can maintain working. Um, these are other things that we're experienced in, but other people might not think about, um, it's all about, yeah, like I said, protecting the gear and making sure everything works. And have you ever had any of that? not work out as like a bear eating a camera or like not quite drive right. a camera into the sea or <laughs> we've we've missed we've been we've lost a lot of gopros <laughs> um yeah gopros overboard um you know the cameraman drop a camera off a cliff once um we supplied some equipment for um euros euros football um a few years a few years ago and a car caught fire with all the equipment in it so we've actually got a burnt a mirror. Um, <laughs> that, so that had to be replaced. Um, so that was an interesting one. So that was replaced in Paris um, within a, couple, a day or two, I think. I managed to get on the Eurostar and replace everything. Um, but yeah, that was that was a that was an interesting phone call. Huh. So uh, a day in the life for you guys, yeah, can be quite different from day to day. Every day is different. Yeah, yeah. that's crazy. <laughs> um, yeah, feel free to name drop highest profile like clients you've ever worked with. If you're allowed to talk about it. Um 
Oh, Disney Plus, BBC, Netflix, Amazon, yeah. all the big players, really. Um, the... Yeah, it's hard to say because everyone's sort of a big dog in their own area as well. Yeah. And that's the benefit of being able to work with the people we work with. We work with sort of Sony Music on music events and then Netflix shows and whatnot. And you could say they're all sort of big dogs at what they do. So, yeah, I wouldn't say there's anyone you could say is the highest profile. I haven't worked on Star Wars yet, but that's... <laughs> That's the dream. That's the dream. So, like, won some, yeah, Lucas Arts and whatnot. That would be, that'd be a good one. But yeah, I think everything we do is, we try and make to the highest standard as they can do. So we'd hope that everyone's at the top of their game if we're supplying them the right stuff. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Any uh, particular like clients, companies that are like really nice to work with. We like all our local areas. Um, you guys, for your... Terran are great to work with. Oh, perfect. What a good answer, guy. <laughs> Man, take that, Disney. Um, we always try and work with uh, local companies as well. There's a company in Tooting, there's a studio, like Mitchum. Like, we like to try and keep things... Yeah, we like we like our personal relationships in the local area as well. Um, little studios and things like that we like to work with. But, I mean, yeah, we're proud to work with anybody. Yeah, I think that's one thing about rental house as well is it comes back to relationships and keeping it sort of family based and not pushing other clients aside for bigger higher clients or whatever it's just it's building a trust between the two of you so it is sort of like a family you're calling a friend to help you out on a shoot rather than a business transaction yeah yeah <laughs> right how much how much of your work then comes from i guess like local companies, like you just said, and then how much comes from the big studios. Um, obviously, the big studios are going to have the bigger budgets, the bigger projects. Um, but like you said, it's really important to maintain those local relationships as well. About 30, 40% is um, south, south of the river. Um, and then, yeah, we seem to expand to anywhere, really. Um, again, it's just sort of boosting our network of freelancers that we work with. Um, if we help out a cameraman in one day, then they return the favor. Um, like we, it, they, we sometimes invite freelancers in to teach some of our warehouse staff as well. So it's just another way to, for them to grow their knowledge, knowledge base, and further their own careers. Um, it's all it's all useful, in, like networking. Cool. Um, yes. Towards the end, uh, do you have any advice, insight, recommendations, anything like that? For anyone looking to get started in the film industry or looking to pursue a similar path as your guys' Um, Yeah, I would say if you want to be behind a camera working on shoots and whatnot, I think kit room is just definite solid way to go. Just get your hands on that kit, get using it. And uh, yeah, you can, you can go freelance from there and there's so many different routes to go down. As Corey said earlier, the sound, grip, lighting so many specialties you can learn from being on the floor in the kit room yeah definitely i think um few few people in my career have joined as a joined the kit room and then suddenly find their own niche um a few of them going to work in steady cam or drone operating there's different areas to it um i think without trying them not really sure what you, what you want to do cool um yeah so if you guys want to just plug uh, where we, like, people can find and some more information on Film Store. Um, go ahead and give people, you know, where they can find your work if you guys have anything you want to share. Anything like that. Of course, we're a Film Store rental. We're based in Ellsfield at the moment. Um, we're potentially moving further out, but we're looking to expand. Um, our main email address is info at filmstorerental.com. Um, if they get in touch on there and mention either myself or Jack, we will see those emails and we'll respond as soon as we can. So that brings us to the end of this episode of Tailon Talks. We hope you enjoyed our conversation with our guests today. As always, we want to thank you for tuning in and being a part of our community as we continue to grow our audience and bring you more exciting guests from the creative industry. If you have any topics or guests you would like us to cover or would have any interest in being a guest yourself, please reach out to us via Instagram at Tailon Media or visit our website at tailon.co.uk. And of course, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review the show. Your support helps us reach more listeners and bring even more valuable content to our audience. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you again on the next episode.